עכשיו אנחנו מגיעים לחלק שאפשר באמת לכנות אותו כתענוג אמיתי. את האורחת הבאה שלנו, לא נראה לי שיש צורך להציג, רק אני אזכיר שהיא הוגדרה בעבר כאלילה יהודית חסרת המעצורים של מעמד הביניים, וכיום היא מקווה להוסיף לתואר גם לוחמת למען ישראל. מי שהייתה חתומה על אחת מסדרות הקומיות הכי מצליחות בארצות הברית, מי שמעולם לא הסתירה דעה שהייתה לה או נכנעה לפוליטיקלי קורקט, וגם מי שמודה שעשתה פניית פרסה מאוד גדולה ביחס שלה לישראל, רוזן בר היא עדיין אחת שתמיד שווה להקשיב לה, לשמוע מה שיש לה לומר, כי זה בטח יהיה מצחיק, שונה ומרענן, ולכן רק טבעי שהיא תהיה פה בוועידה הזו, כמי שמנהלת בעצמה. מערכה נגד המצב של ישראל בקמפוסים בארצות הברית, וכאשר הגיעה הזמנה להשתתף בכנס היא ענתה, לא היה יכול להיות זמן יותר טוב בשנה לעמוד לצד העם שלי ולהילחם למען ישראל, בדיוק כמו שאסתר המלכה קראה לאחד את העם היהודי כנגד אויב אכזר שרצה להשמידנו, אז גם היום רוזן בר אומרת צריך לעמוד ביחד. Please join me and give a special Jerusalem welcome to the one and only רוזן בר. Roseanne will give a speech and then she will be joined by Yediot Achonot reporter Yaniv Halili for a Q&A. Hello everybody. Well, it's wonderful to be here in Jerusalem with you, and I'm, I'm so excited to be attending this conference. I'm bringing with me my mother, who has never been to Israel before. In her 83 years, and she is uh, very excited to be here, too. I thank Chen Mazig and... Um, Stand with us for hosting me and bringing me here. I met Chen on social media where his words were like a blinding light in a sea of darkness there on Twitter um, where there's just so much anti-Semitism. And uh, it's, a, it's unbelievable, actually. I've always been an outspoken person because I'm a comedian and the subjects of racism, classism, and sexism were important subjects for me to lampoon and stand against as a proper socialist like my father and, thank you, and his father before him, a Russian Jewish immigrant in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, becoming more and more political since uh, 9-11, I found myself one day asked by the former presidential nominee of the Green Party, the American Green Party, Cynthia McKinney, to carry the water for the left, as she put it, and to represent by running for the party's nomination myself. Perhaps because of the fact that a lot of people had no idea that I was Jewish, because I'm not the American stereotype. Uh, being from Salt Lake City, Utah, rather than New York or New Jersey. Um, I've been privy my whole life to hearing things non-Jews say about Jews, which they might not say if they knew they were speaking in front of one. During my campaign about 2012, everything I'd ever believed about the left was severely shaken, and the scales began to fall from my eyes in many ways. And I had to admit that many of those I considered comrades were naked bigots who had absolutely no interest in peace between Israel and Palestinian Arabs at all, as I did. It was shocking to realize that what I considered criticism of Israel many, many times gave way to the regular garden variety anti-Semitism that I'd heard all of my life, which is basically you know, the code word Rothschild, every time you turn around. During my campaign, which I filmed as a documentary, I became more and more afraid of what I saw gathering in the United States. I saw first Jews and African Americans divided over American-Israel policy, and Jews against Jews divided too. 
I spoke about Israel during my campaigns for president and was frequently shouted down by leftists, so I learned, because I'm a comic, to answer the totally pre-programmed questions with a real answer that came from me and not from any centralized NGO or group. That did stop people in their tracks for a minute or two, but they would invariably return to regurgitating the talking points they were being paid or self-appointed to regurgitate. I'm certainly not here to defend the indefensible. I don't do that anywhere. Israel has many things about it which need correction, like every single other state and nation on earth. May all the things wrong in this Jewish state be immediately addressed and reconciled. That is my prayer and the promise of Rav Cook, one of the founders of Zionist philosophy, that the nation, once restored to its land, will also be restored to our true national character, that of the light bearers of freedom, brotherhood, excellence, and expanding new vistas of intelligence. We Jews can, some, can be somewhat rude, demanding, and intransient, and more opinionated than most at times. Uh, we are a people who get quite tense after the terrible things that have been repeatedly done to us, and yet Jews don't care what religion other people are, and we would never dream of denying any religious minority their right to worship. Many religions and religious freedom itself are part of the diversity of Israel. We also believe that people have the right to be free of religion, too. But by God, we lack the supreme gall and insensitivity of a typical left-wing peace activist trust funder living in Chicago to suggest that one-third of the world's surviving Jews should not be allowed to buy or own or live on land inside any Arab state after centuries of citizenship there, nor to be allowed to live in only uh, one tiny place behind Green Line in our own homeland when we, where we are called settlers and occupiers after Warsaw. In fact, the Arab Nakba of, mil, of nearly one million Arabic Jews and the theft of their wealth of centuries followed the Shoah. Yet American groups like Code Pink and Jewish Voice for Peace and even J Street have yet to mention one word about any of that, though many Jews are in those groups. BDS is right-wing and fascist, make no mistake. The fact that it pretends to be of the left helps to obscure the fact of the ethnic cleansing of Jews and Christians in all Arab states, happening since 1948 when the entire Arab world began its still ongoing boycott of Israel. Those who foster and monetarily support BDS against Israel are paid directly or indirectly by interests of those same now Jude and Ryan Arab states where real tribal, racial, racial, religious, and gender apartheid exist, unlike in integrated Israel. <laughs> BDS is part of what I call the fake left, that peculiar left whose spokespeople are from privilege, like Ali Ubu Abunima, whose father was the Jordanian ambassador to the UN, and Max Blumenthal, trust funder son of war profiteer Sidney Blumenthal. This left cares nothing about unions or working people, their wages, their health coverage, their fair share of the profits they work to produce, which is incidentally what the actual left lives, breathes, and fights for. This fake left of trust funders of privilege have created a profitable worldwide network to slander, threaten, blood libel Jews with the same trash used by the czars of Russia, Spanish Inquisition, Nazis, and Hamans throughout the witch-burning European Middle Ages, where hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Jewish women and men were thought to be witches and BDS'd, then burned at the stake for the canard that we were the cause of the bubonic plague. The question I ask myself since childhood has been, why does anti-Semitism continue to exist despite its great cost to all of humanity? 
and I believe the answer is that it is the most profitable tactic, the greatest tool in the heist of all working people's wealth by the ruling classes, those educated sons of ambassadors, presidential advisors, those popes, imams, preachers, so-called men of God, professors, presidents, prime ministers, czars, nobles, chancellors, and royal blue-blooded pharaohs, kings, and queens. The rich and privileged feudalists know that ethnic strife, division, racial animosity, gender violence, debt, and lack of medical care or jobs help keep people distracted. Uh, they also know that if you add self-righteous religious fervor to the above and simmer it, you can get holy wars that go on forever, guaranteeing their family's dynasties remain unmolested. People in power pay handsomely for a special wordsmith to craft some concise genocidal slogans like, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free of Jews. The selling of weapons and the promotion of nuclear proliferation continues to be the most profitable business on earth for those who own the stock markets, all the laws, and all the people on earth. They could never sit in the same room with us here for one minute unless it's to promote some cockeyed idea they are selling at the moment, such as their just published revisionist history books in which Arabs or Aryans become the actual Jewish people and Jewish people become the Nazis. Revisionist historians of the fake left are really just the updated Holocaust deniers of the 1980s. When the far left and the far right think of freedom, both of them immediately think they need to rush to defend Nazis' right to speak in threatening condemnation of Jews, but never the other way around. Universities which allow revisionist history, and I'm speaking about America, also allow trash science, as happened in German universities under fascism. False science, false history, false narrative. The immoral and insane racist anti-Semitism of Ferrers, of Pharaohs and Führers never fades from the Jewish landscape for very long. BDS doesn't want peace, nor do they want peace negotiations. They use code words which expose that, as, such as the code word occupation, which is actually an imperialist term when applied to Israel. And you've probably noticed that they use that word a lot, getting all the mileage they can out of it, which if their hated peace negotiations ever occurred, they would have to use instead the legally correct words, disputed territories. And that would just ruin their self-righteous, libelous fun. Disputed territories means the question of security for both sides will be addressed to be resolved in good faith with honest dialogue between two parties seeking solution and redress. BDS uses the incorrect and coded word occupation as it applauds Abbas for refusing to negotiate peace and apologizes for his hate mongering and inciting for the murder of Jewish civilians who are all guilty whether they are Israeli, French, or Brazilian. This helps to create theater for social media and better yet, to further forestall peace talks until perhaps after all Arab Jews are not only expelled to Israel but driven into the sea and the state which offered them safety destroyed through intifada. These campus BDS factories are anti-truth, and the truth is they work very hard to silence their opponent's points, rather than to engage in civil communication and dialogue that leads to the actual redress and the employment of solutions what, which might actually work for the everyday people at risk. But to absolute fascists, negotiation means losing. Only by silencing the outraged opinion of those it wishes to exterminate can any fascist narrative continue to exist because it is a lie whose center cannot hold in the threatening and inevitably victorious face of fact.
The truth is peace must be negotiated, and fascists never negotiate. That's how you know they're fascists. <laughs> it's not going to happen until pressure is brought to bear by all intelligent and moral people everywhere who will no longer tolerate war for the profit of a few at the expense of the many anymore. First, they say Jews out of Egypt go to Palestine. And I remember when I was a little girl, everybody talking about fight for Palestine in my Jewish family because Jews were called Palestinian then. Then they say Jews out of the Middle East go back to Germany or Spain or Poland, Poland where you came from after we, the pre-EU, wiped our butts with your art, your savings, your lives, and the lives of your children, and drove you to Israel. Well, we may have lost our moral compass there for a century or so, but now, now we fancy ourselves as peacemakers who desire justice for those people who swear to kill all the Jews in the Middle East, and those, especially those who don't wish to be minorities living under Arab rule. Obviously, that did not work, or those Arab states would have Jews living in them. In order to continue to be successful scapegoat farmers and to hold the Jews as their moral hostages, BDS racist Jew haters and their deluded Jewish best friends in the United States back boycotting Jews who want to settle freely in the Middle East and not just in a tiny fraction of it. Boycott will help to isolate and disenfranchise Jews until such a time that from the river to the sea, all of UN partitioned Palestine will be Jew free. Again, you cannot possibly make this shit up, folks. You can't make it up. The, e the UN, EU, and the trust funder led BDS left are all crazy. Uh, they refuse to see what's right in front of their faces. That Israel is a state full of millions of good people who want peace. That Israel is not a dream, but a solid reality that is not going anywhere. Instead of building collapsing tunnels, Hamas should cease occupying the Palestinian people's funds and get on to rebuilding a lawful structure of protection for Palestinians instead of paying them to kill themselves and take a Jew or two along with them. Talk about anti-Semitism. <laughs> Peace and equality are the biggest threat to BDS, and as an old socialist, I keep thinking that that is the real hope. We want to solve the problems that we are responsible for, but it's impossible without, first of all, agreeing that the larger problem is and has always been unaddressed and that it is the issue of double standards. Let's start there and then proceed to matters of land. Without just an ethical redress for the 2,000-year-old use of double standards against a victim first removed from their land and then from the earth itself over and over again, the arrogant and ignorant who see themselves as righteous are just blowhards, liars, and bloodthirsty bigots. These campuses, BDS factories, are anti-truth, and the truth is they work very hard to silence their opponents' points, rather to engage in civil communication and argument and discussion that leads to actual redress and the embrace of solutions which might actually work for the everyday people at risk. Only by silencing, I already read this part, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> boy, this got screwed up. Hold on, I got like one more sentence and then I'm out of here. What the heck? Um, here it is. <laughs> Intelligent and moral people know that peace between Israel and her neighbors and cousins is not only possible but quite probable with the creation of the right words at the right time. In the story of Esther, we learn that power is strung together with words and it is words which can take it all apart. Truth and fact are the Jewish people's ultimate weapons against liars and revisionist erasers of our history as the people of Eretz Yisroel. So let's consider that we are here today in Jerusalem together as proof that we are indeed 
who we've always said we were. Thank you. Thanks. Glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, can we hear? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yaniv Halili, and give another round of applause to Roseanne Barr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Are you? And yeah. you, your mom is very happy to be here. She's here with us yep. for happy. the first time in Israel. Yep. So we're very happy that uh, we got a chance to have you here at, at this conference. And um, I'd like to start and ask you about um, a statement that, uh, that was made uh, recently. Roger Waters from uh, Pink Floyd said recently in an interview that fellow musicians and actors are terrified to speak out against Israel. They're afraid that their career will be destroyed. Now, you've, you've spent decades in the limelight, and um, I'm wondering, is this the case? Do you think that um, celebrities, actors, musicians are afraid to speak out against Israel because then their career will be quote-unquote destroyed? Yes, I do think that he's right about that, and I think that's a damn good thing, too. I, I don't think he would ever go to, say, Africa and tell them they're not black enough. He'd be real scared to do that. But uh, he doesn't seem to have very much fear, so that kind of makes a liar of him. And he feels comfortable saying those oh, things? he feels more than comfortable. He feels compelled and like he's on some kind of a mission. So that's a lie. Everything he says is a lie. So um, you support Israel without a fear. You speak out, you say uh, pro-Israeli things. Have you, do you I, I say, I'm not, I'm not a parrot. And, uh, you know, I, I just feel that uh, when, when, I'm, when I'm proud and happy about Israel, I'm so proud and happy. And when I'm um, mad at Israel, I'm mad at Israel. So I say that too. I, I, uh, I, I'm not a parrot. And do you feel that your career has been affected by things that you've said? Was <laughs> <did> you... <laughs> yeah, but I think it worked for me. I think for me, I don't know why, but uh, I say Baruch Hashem. The, I, it worked for me, and it continues to work for me to be known as an outspoken woman who um, can't be bought. It's cool. <laughs> it is a definition of cool. It is. It's like that, that's the real way to live your life, I feel. It is for me. That, that when I feel mor morally obliged to say something, I will say it. And uh, just like we were talking here, the, the hard part is finding the right way to say it, which that's been a big journey for me. <laughs> But there is a right way to say everything. So uh, saying something the right way, meaning uh, sometimes having a good PR as well, public relations, and one of the notions that uh, we hear My from... My publicist is here, and he, he, uh, <laughs> he tears his hair out daily at things I do, so... <laughs> well, maybe know, he can, he can help us that. here, because uh, the notion is that a lot of people say that Israel has... Uh, bad PR abroad and yeah. one of the ways these days to create good publicity for a country is using famous people, celebrities uh, to come and visit and to speak out uh, for Israel but yet we don't see a lot of people uh, in Hollywood around the world coming and, and speaking up and, and being very vocal about their well, support. I think people are afraid because you know um if, you, if you've ever been shouted down by these uh, P P BDS people that are um, on every campus in the United States and, and even off campus, uh, you know, in front of synagogues, wherever they want to go, uh, they, they feel free to do that. And uh, people are afraid of being targeted, and, and that isn't because they're cowards, it's because they're protecting their lives and their families. And I hope that my coming here and telling everybody how great my trip has been and how uh, wonderful the people here 
of every kind, not just Jews, but of every kind, have been to me that I will help to um, make that attractive and, and good. So um, you, we will talk in a minute about your journey uh, as a Jew and uh, your relationship with Israel. Uh, but before that, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the Jewish community uh, in America. Um, yeah. We also witness uh, a phenomenon of not many American Jews feeling strongly about Israel, uh, wanting to be affiliate, affiliated with Israel. From your point of view, why do you think the reason for that? I think that uh, Jewish unity is very much needed. Um, across class lines and across racial lines um, in America. And uh, I think that that's the responsibility of um, those Jews who are dominant in the media. I think it's up to them to rectify that. But a lot of Jewish leaders suggest that it's very, it's more difficult to support Israel now and, and Jews in America uh, I feel more uh, uh, vocal about other causes. Uh, uh, look, it, it has very much to do with class and race. And, um, you know, that's one thing that really, really bothers me to see privileged European students of Jewish descent on campus having no idea about the Nakba of brown Jews and um, like to actually passively be supporting that and I, I think and I have tried and uh, sometimes been successful I have gone to uh, those groups of Ashkenazi Jews and said you know here are Sephardic Jews and Mizrahi Jews and Yemenite Jews and Iraqi Jews all who are, have little tiny communities that are very poor all through California and I'm like y you need to build the bridges right here in our own community first they didn't, largely don't know. It's staggering. But this is, again, a class, a class uh, division that really, really needs some attention. And you don't have it so much here as we do. I mean, people think that all, in America, a lot of Jews think that all Jews are European. It's amazing. And then they find out it's, it's not the case. And, and a lot of um, American Jews, and you mentioned that in your speech, uh, uh, they talk about Israel when they love Israel and they agree with Israel, they support Israel. When they disagree with some of Israel's policy, they, they say that as well. And you mentioned uh, an interesting point in your speech. You said that a few times you criticized Israel from a place of, of caring uh, for Israel and then you found out that your words and, the, and your statements were used and edited and, and... Well, I did not know that when you, uh, you, know, you know, were harshly critical of Israel as I was before 2010. I didn't know when you, when you were doing... I thought it was like being harshly critical of the United States for being in Vietnam and saying this is wrong and terrible and blah, blah. But I, I didn't know that it was just part of a creeping campaign of the delegitimization de of the entire state of Israel and uh, that works to its destruction. I didn't know that because uh, I assumed that Israel was always here and that they couldn't just take a state away from a nation. But by God, that is their goal and it's so audacious and full of gall that that just makes me very very angry and so I, I have since that year 2010 um, been been very vocal going at my own expense to places to just look people in the eye and say you know what because I am I'm a very outspoken Jewish woman and I'm not gonna let fame and fortune stop me <laughs> <laughs> But I'll go right saying that, like, you know, at the Green Party, I, I said, you're, 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 when I ran, I said, the Green Party's um, platform on Israel is completely wrong. And, you know, I, I do believe that cost me <laughs> the nomination, but oh well. You got to say it, right? You, you, you got to say it. 
people say like, should we, are we helping them by, you know, engaging with them? They ask me that all the time. And um, but I don't know. It, it's a paradox, but definitely we can't just be, you know, be silent in the face of it. Definitely. Where, where do you think that the, the, the line between um, uh, a legitimate uh, protest against Israel and uh, sugar-coating anti-Semitic agenda, where does this line To stand? me, after running for president in the United States and addressing delegates of the Green Party in all the states, um, this is my opinion, but I think the line is BDS. I think that is the line. Um, you can be critical of a, a state or a nation's policies, but like to uh, work to exclude them from, uh, you know, the economy after Yari did that one very successfully in in Europe. It just stinks. It's there's no. There's no way for them to do that and uh, remain moral. There isn't. That's my opinion. So BDS is the line. Um, and you mentioned uh, you ran for, uh, you were running for uh, presidential elections in 2012. Well, I was always kind of joking that I would run. I mean, since my show was on the air in the 90s, I always said I was going to run for president of the United States and prime minister of Israel as a twofer. I always was saying that. But then as it moved, it was like people were saying, why don't you really try it? And I did. And um, it, it was a, an incredible and, uh, and mostly positive and wonderful growth experience that I, I got was my name was on the ballot and people voted for me. It, it was a wonderful thing. And you said that you were, uh, uh, you, you consider running for a uh, prime minister of Israel. I mean, I think that quite a lot of people would support that, especially, <laughs> especially now. I, I, I don't, do I, I don't have to marry Sarah. <laughs> you don't have to marry Sarah Netanyahu, no. Um, but, um, well, always in my heart, uh, and now that I'm kind of old, I guess I'm, I'm older than I like to admit. But I'm 63 and I've done so many wonderful things. I've had such a great life. I have a wonderful family. I couldn't be uh, more rich in so many ways. And you know what? It really is about being a Jew. Uh, when you've come to that point in your life, like a lot of us do, the big turn on is to be of service. It's a huge turn on. And, uh, uh, you know, in our small communities and, you know, wherever we can go, I like to go there and do good things. I mean, that's what our religion is really about, right? So to conclude uh, uh, this session, I'd like to ask you, you've spent uh, uh, almost a week, uh, I believe, in, in Israel, uh, traveling around, having your, your mother here. What is the one thing that you'll be taking from, from this visit? Unfortunately, the one thing I would like to take, I, I can't, and that's the, the hummus. <laughs> Here, that's a, the best hummus ever. And, uh, but uh, I, I will just be taking the memory of uh, Jewish people um, uniting uh, in, in our own common interest that's just, and on Purim, it, it was an amazing Purim for me. Thank you very much. Ladies and Thank gentlemen, so Roseanne much. Barr. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you, Roseanne Barr, for making it all the way to Israel to share with us your inspiring thoughts. And